And hello, we're back with you, Dr. Larry, Senior Pastor of Empowerment Faith Kingdom Center for Ambassadors. We're excited to bring to you once again the teaching of the kingdom. Now we're dealing with the uh, overall subject, if you want to keep up with us, we're dealing with the revelation of the kingdom. This particular um, segment here, we're going to deal with the concept of a nation, the kingdom concept of a nation, which is very, very, very important. Of course, you know, uh, uh, Islam go by the nation of Islam. See, that's a kingdom concept, the nation of Islam. The Islam. They don't go by the body of Islam. They don't go by Muslims. They go by the nation of Islam because there is a powerful tool within that. There's a powerful foundation that bring unity. This is why you don't see uh, a lot of the uh, persecutors and, and the haters, you know, dealing with the nation of Islam, the way they deal with other people and other groups, because they know when they attack one, they're attacking the whole nation. That's very powerful. Now we're going to look in the scriptures, the scriptures, and see where we should be at in that kingdom definition of term and how we should be identifying ourselves. And we're going to look at the relabeling, which came under the category of replacement theology, which was done based on Greek Roman concepts, Greek Roman doctrine and theology, which was used to start the uh, Roman Catholic Christian church. Remember Christianity was started by the Roman government. It's a religion, it's not a nation, it's a religion. So we wanna look into some things and you know, when we teach the kingdom, the kingdom is automatically controversial to religion. It's automatically controversial to re uh, replacement theology. It automatically, goes against the Greco-Roman concepts in terms of religious theological philosophy. Automatically goes against that. So we're not all for out in left field. We're teaching the word of Elohim. So let's get right into it. We're going to start off with some scriptures. We're going to start off with some scriptures. And as we go in, uh, we're going to mention this and we're going to come out the uh, same way. There's a, a verse in uh, Mishlea 18 and 21 that we're going to begin and we're going to come out, we're not going to go to a, a mishalea called Proverbs 18.21. And the scripture says, death and life is in how we use language, the power of words. And of course, you all know on the Hebrew calendar, uh, we're in a decade of education, 80s. A day, 5, 7, 8, 2 is coming up. We're in 8, 1 right now. And that 80 come from the Hebrew Olivet pay, which means the power of the father's word or the authority of the word of the father. It has to do with teaching, with teaching. All right. So let's look at these scriptures. I got several of them here. We're going to go into them now. And we just want to bring out how much emphasis is placed on the word or term nation versus. And we're going to look at the body of Christ. We're going to look at that term. We're going to look at Christian. We're going to look at that term and we're going to look at the concepts of the kingdom in terms of labeling or the father intent for his people in the earth. Now, he says right here in Bereshit 12 and 2, let's, and we're going to begin reading. Take, are we there? Great. All right. It says, and the scripture says, I will make you into a great nation. Notice he didn't say religion. He didn't say body. He said nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Who was he talking to? Abraham. Abraham. Through the seed of Abraham, the Messiah would come. And at Bereshit 17 and 4. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many what? Nations. He still haven't mentioned a denomination. He hasn't mentioned a religion. Haven't mentioned a Greek concept that has relabeled the believers. Bereshit 17 and 5. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be what? Abraham. What did the father do? He took the two last letters that spell Yahweh, added to Abram, and you came up with Abraham. Here's a concept of getting in covenant. Even in marriage, the woman take on the last name of the man. This is where this concept come from. For I have made you a father of what? Many nations. Bereshit 17 and 6. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. Are you getting it? All right, here we go. Uh, Bereshit 17 and 16 on the next one. You got that? 
I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. Who is he talking about? Uh, Sarah had to change her name from Sarah to Sarah. And Sarah means princess. Sarah means one who was in charge or to be dominant. So the father did what? He changed uh, Sarah to Sarah. He changed Abram to Abraham. That is, this, this concept is a kingdom concept. Notice the father is changing their names because within a name is a revelation of destiny and purpose and character. Just like in the Hebrew culture, when they named their children, it was a revelation of the destiny in their life. They didn't name them catalog like we do today or ABC TAC, uh, you know, just coming up with something. I'll just name it. I'll just do that. See, names are very important in terms of identity, in terms of lineage, and in terms of tracing back to the source. So notice the father himself changed their names to reflect who they were and what he would bring out of them. Now, we're going to get into Shemot, Exodus 19 and 5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my co uh, covenant, and he's talking about talking to the nation of Israel now, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. He said, everything belongs to me, but I'm going to make you special. And he was given uh, the nation of Israel an opportunity to carry out or carry the torch in, of, of the mandate that the father gave to man in the beginning. And that was to colonize the earth, make the earth just like heaven with the government and culture and laws of the kingdom. But they rejected that. They rejected that. They didn't, they didn't want to be a nation. They wanted to be a special nation. They want to be like the world. They wanted a president. They wanted democracy. They wanted republic type government. They wanted communism. They didn't want the kingdom government. They rejected that and they paid the price for it. Now, here we go again. The kingdom concept of a nation is revealed in kingdom definition of terms. Look at Shemot 19 and 6. Do we have that? 19 and 6. Now watch this. You will be you will be you will be for me a kingdom. Watch this. And you're going to see this repeated. A kingdom of what? Priests and a what? Holy or special. Another term for holy is special. A holy or special nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now, look at Kepha. I left Kepha. Uh, first Peter. I called Peter. Two and nine. But you watch this, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Elohim special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. These are exact. Notice what he gave the nation of Yisrael, the, of the sons of Yisrael, his sons, he developed a nation out of them, you know, running back to Abraham. He gave them an opportunity to do what we as kingdom citizens have to carry out today. He did not mention Christians here. He did not mention the body of Christ. We're going to get into that because definition of terms are very, very, very important. Now, notice he said chosen people. He says here a special possession, the same, same phraseology, same words, same call. Same mandate that was in Shemot 19 and 6. No different. Notice now there's no mention of a religious organization, period. Remember, Yeshua never came to start religion. He came to reestablish the government of the kingdom in earth and reconnect mankind to our original mandate. Everything else is, is, is religion. Yeshua is not in it, period. I'm here to tell you. So in these definition of terms, and how we label ourselves are very important because, again, you remote, you know what it, it, it reflects uh, and what it reveals. Destiny, character, purpose. You can find it all in a name. Remember, Adam was given the assignment of naming everything in the earth and whatever he called it. That's what it was. And the words say, if you add to or take a freight away from the word, then a curse is on you. So we can see why a lot of bad stuff is happening. And bad results are coming out of religious thinkers and religious institution and religious doctrine. So hate, division, schism, immorality. You'll find all of that 
in the lives of religious people who refuse to accept the kingdom teaching. Now, if you're a kingdom citizen, the message is to you is to me, change the way you think. I'm changing the way I think all the time because that's what Yeshua said. He said, change the way you think because the government of the kingdom is here. So since the government of kingdom is here and we know is here, then we have to change the way that we think and bring our thoughts in alignment with his thoughts, bring our ways in alignment with his ways. But we have to search the source of every thought that we have allowed in our belief system. So he said, your chosen generation, a royal priesthood, another word for priest is representative or ambassador, representative or ambassadors. And then he said, a holy or special nation. So the citizens of the kingdom of heaven in the earth, we are a what a group of ambassadors who have the same national citizenship. That that means we have the same privileges, the same rights, the same agenda. There is no division. Yeshua said a house divided won't stand. A nation divided won't stand. The kingdom of heaven is not divided. The kingdom of heaven in the earth is what's called the kingdom of Yah or kingdom of God. And that is the direct influence and authority of the government of the kingdom of heaven in our hearts, in our lives on earth that are being expressed through the lives of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That's what it is. Now, holy nation, another word for holy is integrity. Integrity. Hear, O Yisrael, uh, Yahweh Elohim is one. He is one in purpose. He is one in plan. He is one in agenda. He is the same all the time and every day. And that's what holiness is, another mean of holiness. And you know, it's being the same way all the time, no hidden agenda, uh, no, no side doors, no side steps, no replacement theology, no add-ons, no replacement holidays, no replacement names, none of that. Everything must be the same in order to be holy and special. So these are some scriptures that we base in this foundational teaching on. And this, we just scratching the surface. We scratching the surface. Remember uh, when uh, Yahweh, uh, Yeshua gave Moshe. 10 nation, national laws. It's called the 10 commandments. A commandment is a declaration of a law. The father gave Moshe 10 laws, covenant laws. Another term is covenant that was necessary to establish a nation. These laws are laws that govern a nation. They are not passed. Replacement theology been teaching for years and people, there are other people who don't even consider uh, the Tanakh was called the Old Testament. Don't even consider uh, the poetic writings. Don't even consider the historical writings. Don't even uh, consider the prophetic writings. They they go with what's called the New Testament. New Testament is not is another ambiguous terms that use to cover up the truth. The New Testament was formed or coined by a government appointed Catholic bishop of Sardis, Melito. Around 150 AD, he changed the term, definite kingdom definition term of messianic scriptures or the writings of that reflect the Messiah's will, purpose and plan to the New Testament. And see, that was labeled with the religious church or the organization that the Roman government started. Never, he never, never the earlier believers, the scholars, the disciples, the nation of the kingdom, citizens in the earth never, ever called the Messianic scriptures, the New Testament that came about with religion came on the scene and a disconnect came in. That's and then it was put in writing, put in translation and transferred. And see, that's the educational principle. The kingdom have an educational principle. And one of those principles is to inculcate the laws, the behavior patterns, you know, the thoughts, sources of thoughts, the way stuff are done through generations to transfer these same patterns through generations. And we call it the tradition of men, the doctrine of men and not the doctrine of Elohim. So you see these uh, scriptures here that is reflecting the original intent of a nation and how the father see us in the earth. OK, now let's go to this point here. Sources of thought must be traced to determine if if it is the truth, if it is the truth. You see, are we there? 
Okay. All right. Now we got three things we want to look at. All right. Sources of thought must be traced to determine if it is the truth. Truth is original knowledge. If it's not original, then it's not the truth. You remember in the place that, that had an open heaven in the earth in ancient Eden, uh, Akabula, later called translated into Africa. In that place, there was an open heaven where Elohim placed Adam and then he placed Masa Izanigad to begin the human beings who would be on earth, who would conform to earth and make it look just like the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> this is what we call the garden, a place of cultivation. Remember what happened. Now we just said the source of thought must be traced to determine if it's true. Now, when the fallen angel, not a snake, the scripture doesn't validate that period. Care what scientists say. When the fallen angel Lucifer began to speak, not with Adam, but with Masa Izaniga, and later uh, called Hava by Adam and translated into the English Eve, the first thing he did was put a thought of doubt in their minds, because both of them were right there. He said, has Elohim said, you are not to receive knowledge other than what's coming from him. That's, that's, that's the factual words that he said. The, free, the fruit and the tree is symbols trying to get us to understand. It's painting a picture, a picture, a pictorial picture, so we can understand what he was saying. Fruit is the evidence of a seed. The seed is a source. So when he said, the fruit of a tree, he was saying <clears throat> the source that will reproduce this type of lifestyle, this, these types of behavior patterns is, is in, embedded in the seed. The seed produces after its own kind. All right. So when he said the fruit and the tree was a being, Yahshua Yahweh called Isaiah 61, said we are trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh and then a Tehillim. Psalms 1 said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the what? Counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor uh, sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight shall be in the what? The teaching of Yahweh and he shall be like a what? Tree. He, now we know he wasn't taught. He was using a physical tree, the picture to paint a truth, a tree planted by the rivers of water. We are people. We are human beings. The water is we're not standing in the water. But he gave that pictorial thought to invoke our memory and paint a picture in our minds of what that means. Remember, images come in picture. All right. So the same thing was in Barashiv when he said, don't eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. He was saying, don't accept the words of this being who possessed knowledge of good and evil. His name is Lucifer. Let me just go tell you. And it wasn't a snake. So it's the same thing with uh, uh, thoughts. We have to trace the source. We have to trace the source of names. Names are very important. Language. Remember how death and life is in the power of the words that come out of our mouth and how we use them. Now, so let's look at this. All right. Let's look at the term Christian and where did it come from? You know, we mention this all the time and we trace to the source and we found out it's not a kingdom concept. It wasn't an original application uh, or name placed on citizens of heaven to identify them by from within. It didn't come from the Holy Spirit. So where did it come from? Three sources the secular world, the Roman government, and the translators. Now, four sources, The uh, no, three, I got that number. You know, I got the term, Chris, that's a question, but we got three sources. That is the secular world, the Roman government, and the translators. Let's look at it and prove it out. Now, we got some points here. Let's look at these. The Greek word for Christian is Christos. No mention of the Hebrew. Remember, we just looked in the original language of Hebrew, and the father said he wanted to make a nation out of Abraham and all nations would be blessed through him. He never said a Christian out of him and all Christians be blessed through him. Now watch this. So it's a Greek Roman concept. The Latin word for Christian is Christus. So we have what? The Greeks and the Romans. All right. The believers first became known as Christians as an appellation of ridicule. 
meaning it came from the outside and not from within. Never was a concept. They never labeled themselves as Christians. They never called themselves Christians. As a matter of fact, this word Christ, you're going to the actual translation that should be there is Messiah. They put Christ so you can jump over Mashiach in the Hebrew is a Hebrew word Mashiach. And when it's translated to English, it's Messiah. All right. So what happened? They was making mockery of them, saying that these are the people who fallen, fallen that guy who said he is the Messiah. That, that's what was going on. And so when you get to the translators in their efforts to label or relabel kingdom concepts and apply the religious Greco Roman concepts, you know, in, in, in the hearts of the citizen of heaven, they stamped it in there and you have to check translations. You have to challenge them. Now here's another, uh, here, here's some scripture that will reflect that. Look at Messiah acts 26 and 28. All right. And the word Christian is only found three times, three times. And I check trans some, some translation only mentioned it two times. See, that's an, that's an alert. Uh, that's an alert right there. That's an alarm sounding right there. And the script said, let every word be established by the, what the word of two or three witnesses. Now, if you see something mentioned more, another definition of term mentioned more than you do this one. That's a key that somebody been in a chicken house changing stuff around. Then Agrippa, who is Agrippa? He is a Roman leader, a Roman leader. It, it, call, in the scripture referred to him as King Agrippa. He is a Roman government political official and any thing, term, label that come from the government, it's secular. It's going to be secular and it's going to be reflecting a religion. That's all the secular government understand is religion and the secular agenda of that government. So then Agrippa said to Sheol, do you think that that in such a short time you can persuade me to become one of these people who are following that guy who called himself the Messiah? That that's how I was rendered. But notice it's translated put be a Christian. So when you read it, you think that this is a kingdom definition of term and it's not. You would think that in the mind of the father, he wanted to establish Christians on the earth and not a nation of a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You see how replacement theology came in through the indoctrination of Greco Roman uh, philosophy and theology and changed things. And when they changed things that brought the power out also because the Father, do not honor religion. It's man made. Now let's look at another one. And that's in the Bible. That's why you say you have to, we study the scriptures that have uh, been translated in the Bible. And with those translations, you have a lot of error. All right. Now let's look at um, uh, Messiah 11 and 26. These are Greek translations. And remember, there's an Ethiopic or African translation that's older than a Greek translation. So that put out the lie that the Greek is original translation. That, that's a lie. All right, 26. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and uh, Sheol met with the congregation because church is another Greek Roman secular governmental term and taught great numbers of people. Now watch this. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. There it is right there. They were called by the heathens Christians. They were called by the people who weren't born again Christian. They were called by the secular world people who have followed that guy who said he's the Messiah. Because remember, they didn't believe that Yeshua was the Messiah. Disciples is the key right here. Now, in my, <clears throat> if you are a man or a woman and somebody call you a truck, does that mean that you are a truck? Does that mean that you're going to haul some gravel and, and haul loads up and down the highway? No, that is a substitute. In essence, you are a living being. So that's a replacement. If somebody call your car, are you going to sleep in your garage tonight? <clears throat> you're going to go to the gas station and drink gas. Are you going to go and get you some oil and drink some oil? It doesn't make sense, does it? So just because a person is called something doesn't mean that's what they are. 
we're only called by what the father called us. You understand? This is another thing with the severance of identity, severance of identity. Here's an example. Uh, African Americans. That's another ambiguous term. You can be an African American and not American and not be black. There was a gentleman who won a lawsuit and got fully funded in college. A white man from Africa came to America. Check it out. And he came as an African and he went in the category of African American. So he got the privileges, the resources that were set aside for black African American. But because the term was so broad and making sure that black people don't get the benefits, he won the case. That's how important it is for us to start acknowledging the falsification of what the father intended for his people in the earth. It's in the Bible, but it's translated to make you think a wrong thought, just like the enemy said, had Elohim said, and then they begin to think. So the disciples, the disciples, they were called. Now here is one. Well, let's look at what Kepha said. All right. First, uh, Kepha, uh, I left Kepha one and, uh, four and 16 is right on the same note. Let's look at it. Now, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise Elohim that you bear the name. See, see the apostle, the apostle Peter, he, he, he said, he said, why question? Why is it only one time that an apostle and only one would use this word based on what the translators, translators gave us, gave us one time out of three times it was used and you only find one. So was Kepha, was he a government official? Was he a secular heathen who hadn't been born again? No. So you go back up to what we said. The sources are what? The Roman government, right? The secular world and translators. This is a direct source of a translator's input because it doesn't agree with scripture. They were disciples, not Christians. Kepha would never relabel the disciples. He, he didn't have, his perception was not based on Greco-Roman theology, Greco-Roman concepts. His perception was based on the original kingdom concepts, which are reflected in the Hebrew language. So again, here we have a erroneous translations that is trying to relabel the holy nation into a religious organization to promote their agenda. Now, hopefully we'll get that. We get that. All right. And let's continue to teach here. It's very important that we get a hold of this and stop calling ourselves these terms, which was never based on the original truth of the word and the precepts of the kingdom. You see, the father never had in his mind for these things to happen or us to be labeled as this all done by man. Here go another term. Let's look at this one. Let's look at this one. The term body of Christ is from also a Greek concept. And you will find, I was trying to count them out. I think you find this term about uh, 10 times or something like that. And we're going to look at it. But after we apply kingdom concepts, you're going to see this. This is a translator's mindset being documented and put in the Bible. All right. So it's a Greek concept. And look, here's a lexicon, the Strong's le lexicons. I pulled this note out of here. The Greek philosophers, the who philosophers, the Greek philosophers, who are the Greek philosophers, uh, uh, Socrates, those boys. Yeah, they all in the Bible, all in the translation. Their sources of thought are in there because the guys who did the translation, their source of thoughts were in them. Now, the Greek philosophers treated their human body with this uh, disparagement for this reason in Homer and frequent, frequently <clears throat> added Greek. So this Greek word Soma meant a dead body in which sense the word is occasionally used in the gospels. The usual meaning, however, in the, what he didn't say the Mexican scripture said the new Testament, which is full of Greek thought, Greek concept, Greek philosophy and Greek theology, Roman, Greek or Roman, Roman and ordinary Greek usage is a living body. The New Testament does not share in the philosophic disparagement of the human body. Okay, it's a Greek concept. 
Matter of fact, you would not find this word in the Hebrew. You get the Hebrew words for you'll never find in the Hebrew language a definition of term using the body to be a nation. You, you won't find that. And I'm going to explain to you why Yeshua uh, even used this, this, this definition of term uh, in the Gospels. But you, when you leave from the Gospels, leave from Yeshua, and you go to uh, the writings, the Messianic writings, which were translated because the Messianic was just like Yeshua taught. But when you go to the translation of the Messianic writings going into the New Testament, you're going to see a change. You're going to see a change from the national concept using the uh, communion uh, definition of terms and applying it to relabel the holy nation, the royal priesthood and the citizens of heaven in the earth. Remember, names reveal identity. When you change your name, you serve the identity. That's, now, I just put that straight out of the lexicon. Now, here, here's another note. The phrase body of Christ, note he said uh, Messiah, but the body of Christ is also used as a metaphor. A metaphor is what? A noun. It's a noun. It's a metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to something to which it is not literally applicable. A theme regarded as symbolic of something else. Hey, the citizens of heaven, we're not uh, a, sim a symbol, <laughs> you know, uh, we are literal. The, the holy nation is a fact, a truth. A royal priesthood is the truth of what the father wanted in the earth in terms of his people to be identified. So this metaphor, why do we find a metaphor and this metaphor being taken and labeled to citizens of heaven? Well, again, you go back to the religion and you go back to the translation translators who are building the religion. Now, let's look at the correct usage because, you, like I said, you got several in there. But now when you see it, that it's not a kingdom definition of term, you can see that the translators infuse it from a Greek Roman perception. And it's not a kingdom perception. It's not a kingdom precept. It's not a kingdom concept. Therefore, we have to get that out of our belief system. It's controlling our belief system. If you keep calling a dog a horse a dog long enough, when you said dog, that horse going to look around. You keep calling a dog duck. Hey, duck, come here, duck, 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 duck. Well, ducks don't bark. You keep calling the dog duck. When you say duck, here come the dog. It's the same thing. It's the same principle. It's, 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 it's not good. Let me put it like that. Now, let's look at the original uh, correct usage of this term. The original correct usage of this term. In Matthew 26 and 26, while they were eating, Yeshua took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his Christians. He didn't say that. All right. OK. And gave it to the church. Ecclesia. No. And gave it to his what? Disciples saying, take eat. This is my body. This is my body. And the verse go on say, which is broken for you. Now, notice he is making reference to his physical body in communion, denoting what his physical body would go through so that we can have what we get. He is not talking about his citizen. All right. Now, uh, Corinthian, I left a uh, first Corinthians 10 and 16, the cup of blessing, which we bless. It is not the communion of the blood of the Messiah. The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of the Messiah? All making reference to communion. But when you look at the translations, you say we are many members, but yet one body. Now, in that particular passage, I give a little credit. If Sheol was taking a physical human body to teach a message of how we flow together. But he never, never intended for us to be labeled. So when he said we are the body, he wasn't talking about being labeling us as a group of people called the body of, of, of Christ. That would go against the holy nation. That would go against the royal priesthood. That would go against the intent of the father. And Sheo never went against that. Even though he spoke several languages, he wrote in several languages. The Greeks were not the only people that he wrote letters to. That language was taken and translated into the English. Sheo spoke Hebrew. The Hebrews contested the Greeks. They hated the Greek language. They didn't like anything about them. And most uh, seminaries would not teach you that. They would not teach you that. I've been to one. 
I know I, I'm telling you what I know. All right. So we'll see the original correct usage of this term based on kingdom definition of term. Now, let's look at this. We see the word Christian three times. All right. <clears throat> and we see the body of, of Christ that turns about 10 or 12 times. Now, if we find the word disciple in the Hebrew and if we find it used far more than these definition of terms, the balance has got to shift. The scales got to shift. Here we go. Are we here? The, let's look, let's go to this uh, next one here. The term disciple is from the Hebrew and is a what kingdom concept. All the other ones. Uh, uh, a what religious concept. Now let's look at how many times this word disciple is used in, in a couple translation, the new NIV 299 times. Are we there? Okay. In the new King James version, 275 times Verses three now and 10, the Holman Christian standard Bible, 271 results, the English standard version, 269 times the new American standard Bible 200. Say, did you, you know that we probably didn't. You see the usage. That's why he said the disciples were called. They were relabeled, renamed by secular government. Again, when the government label you, you know, that's not a kingdom concept. Why the government of the kingdom and the government of this world cannot be intermingled intermingled they not cannot be merged they are two stand alone governments two stand alone governments people need to get a hold of that and you know what just happened uh just recently at at the national capital in america where you had a religious secular group of people went in there and basically took over it, and and notice this now religion controlled government in america uh, you had people, Christians up there praying before that happened. You had Christian pastors involved in it. You had law enforcement involved in it. Why? Book of Revelation tells us this. Hazan says there is a false church controlling the government. He called her a prostitute dressed in purple. And she sat on the beast. The beast is the government. That prostitute, that harlot you see there, is the false church is the religious organization that's in the earth parading as though they are the uh kingdom uh citizens matter of fact that label is not even tied to the kingdom church ecclesia that's dealing with politician that's dealing with a senate y you seeing it now it's translating to the word church that's why i keep saying the word church is not that's not a, a label that's not a word for the citizens of heaven. It's a secular Greek word that has to do with politics. Who are Europeans? A black person, you couldn't even be a part of ecclesia in the Greek uh, uh, culture. You couldn't do it. So in the trans, Paul, again, don't lie on Sheol. He didn't use that word. The translators did. So I want to show you that and see how many times disciples is used. Now, here's the original meaning for the word disciple. Original meaning. I'm just pulling straight up out of our digital library and we're dealing with different lexicons. Uh, it, yeah, you see <clears throat> this word right here, Lamad. Lamad. It means well, to be instructed, to be taught, disciples, and accustomed. Now, let's look at some scriptures where these words are used. So, disciple is Lamad. Let's, let me go back there. Let me break that down for you. Uh, you see, right in the middle of this circle, we get, and it'll break out in, in what the program I got. If I click on this yellow, this blue, or this uh, orange, or this red, it immediately take you to all those verses in scripture that this word is used in and give you the meaning. So it's spelled Lamed Mem Dalet. Lamed means, one of the meaning of Lamed is to teach. It's to teach. It has to do with authority, spiritual authority. Okay, Mem is, uh, means the spirit of life, life-given spirit the source of the spirit of life, the spirit that gives life. And then Dalet means to have access, okay, keys, an open door to the government, the kingdom, the teaching of heaven. So a disciple is one who have access to the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom, revelation knowledge of the kingdom. The anointing is 
the avenue by way this knowledge come and teach them. You see, so a disciple is one who is being taught by the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit himself, as a result of having access. Lamed, we see this. Now, also, this word, Lamed, Mem, Dalet, actually spell out the Hebrew Olivet, Lamed. You remember Yeshua said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I'm the letter, words in the Hebrew Olivet. I'm speaking to you through this language. And this particular uh, 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 word here is actually the word spelled out for Lamed. I want to just, that won't caution it. Now, let's look at these scriptures here. <clears throat> Yeshua Yahweh called Isaiah 54 and 13. Do we have it? What does the scripture say? All your children will be what? Taught. That's the word disciple of it. By Yahweh and great will be their peace. No confusion, no division, no racial supremacy, no hate and all of this stuff. I know Christians now calling people idiots and dumb and all kind of stuff because they didn't support their religious leader in government. And then I know Christians now who are calling people dumb, stupid idiots because they did support, uh, uh, didn't, yeah, did support uh, the present out, going on, on the way out, religious leader in government. You see, that is not kingdom. That's all religion. If you are guilty of it, change your mind. You need to get before the Holy Spirit, the Father, and ask him for some help because now the light has exposed religion for what it is. And of course, we did a message called Sword Over America. Another sword is coming in about three years also. It's going to seal the deal. <laughs> Even before all this division took place, that, that Eclipse was sending a message. I know some of y'all was out there, ooh, want to see the Eclipse? Yeah, all right. okay, all right. And the Lord was talking through that Eclipse, telling you that America is marked for the vision, and the present leader that's there is going to make sure that that task is accomplished. The final mark is going to, Take place. Another eclipse is coming about three years. Now, hopefully you all listen or start studying and look at it different. Don't be stargazing and be checking your heart because the deal is going to be sealed. America is not going to concede to unity. It's going to be more division. And the core of the vision is the religious system that controls the government. That's what's being revealed. So the past president did his job in revealing hatred, revealing division, revealing what's going on and use religion as a foundation. So if it's not peace, disciples, scholars are always living in peace and harmony as a holy nation, as a holy nation. You understand? Here's another verse. Yeshua 8 and 16. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up Elohim's instructions among my disciples. Lamed. You see, he never said Christians. He never said Church, he never said body of Christ. He said, my who? Disciples or scholars, my royal priesthood, my ambassadors who are part of my holy nation in the earth. Okay. Look at 50 and 4. The sovereign, Yahweh, has given me a well-instructed tongue. That word, English word, well-instructed, is the Hebrew olive uh, word, lamed, a disciple tongue to know the word that sustains the word. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. Big difference in it. That's why you see this word used in the scriptures over 200 and some times because it's a kingdom concept and it's the intent of the father. You understand? I know many Christians are not instructed, not taught, don't study, don't know the word and just go by whatever a person say. All right. Now, in conclusion, in conclusion, all right, before we go there, in conclusion, definition of terms must be identified and you must trace the source. You got to go back to the source and see where it came from. Now, if you have a precept, and we've been saying this, a truth that's being spoken through a person who is tied to a lie, then it diminishes the power and intent of the truth. It diminishes it. Now, we have watched religious uh, uh, words being said by secular government leaders, and when they say that, all the religion begin to support it and follow. That's why so many religious people 
followed a corrupt leader because this man is going to save us. This man is going to protect Noah's Ark. This man is going to do this. And while I'm on this, here's a good example. Black Lives Matter. You know why religion hated that so much? It's because of the source. Now, the word Black Lives Matter is true because black people still don't, are not treated equal in the United States of America, never have been. Laws of uh, uh, systemic racism is here. This is it, that is here, all kind of stuff is going. We know that. But the source, because the source was corrupted, you understand, it brought a lot of confusion. Black Lives Matter, that is true. That is the truth. The father made black people just like he made white people. And he didn't put white people over black people. He didn't put black people over white people. That's true. But the source, those who founded that and who came up with that label, label, actually their intent was to destroy the core of family. Their whole agenda is against the structure of the kingdom family that the father put in the earth. Now that's where the problem came in with us as kingdom citizens. I said, yeah, that's right. Black mind does matter. The message is right, but the source is wrong. The source is contaminated. And then all the religious folk, including the government, including the, uh, the legal system, law enforcement, everybody else start killing and shooting black folk and riding. And you know, when they went to the Capitol, helicopters there, policemen, there, all kind of stuff there. You know, because religion rose up against the source. And when religion rose up against the source, religion also overlooked the truth that black people matter just as much as you do. That's a prime example. So when religion came in to do something to rise against the government and the election and the results, religion said, we're not having, we're going to have our way. We, we, relig we run this thing. And it was proven. Law enforcement agreed with them, let them in, things like that. You didn't see no choppers, no tanks, no nothing. Prime examples. I'm just telling you what happened. And these are examples of how important it is to trace the source. If the source is a lie and what they're saying is true is going to contaminate it and bring confusion. So whoever, when you put your confidence, Jeremy who 17 says that when you put your confidence in man, man is going to fail you. And he said, put your hope and confidence in Yahweh and never put it in man because it's going to come down to nothing. All through the scripture, if they put your confidence in the flesh, in man, it's like a broken tooth, a foot out of junk, uh, uh, put no confidence in the flesh. And then you had the whole religious organization put their confidence in a person who they appointed, who they anointed, who they said was saved and was there for them. That's what happened. That's why it's so important to understand the concept of a nation relative to kingdom citizens. Now, let's look at our concluding scriptures. Mishleah uh, 18 and 21. Hopefully you have took what we have shared. Consider, think about, change the way that you think. Look at these kingdom concepts for yourself. You're going to come out with the same thing. And for those who got excuses and got another reason, all this kind of stuff, I'm not talking to you. I'm only talking to the people that the Holy Spirit is drawing. That's the only people who receive knowledge of the kingdom. Proof, Matthew 13, around verse 10 through 13, Yeshua said to you, you have been given to, to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, the folks seeking signs, miracles and wonders, the religious folk, I'm going to talk to them so they won't understand what I'm saying. I don't want them to know what I'm saying or uh, receive the truth. They don't qualify to receive it. So, again. Some people hollering, screaming and, and cussing. Keep right on. Some people saying, man, you know what? I never thought about that. You know what? I didn't see that. You know what? That's right. You know what? That did happen. You know what? I always questioned that. You know what? I'm getting ready to make a change. That's who I'm talking to. Now, look at Miss Leah, 18 and 21. Death. Are we there? Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love her will eat of her fruit. There it word fruit again will eat the evidence of the source, will consume the evidence of the source of what? The words that we speak and how we use them. The words that we speak out of our mouths is a result, a revelation of what's in our belief system, our con convictions, 
Convictions come by way of concepts that we receive, original thought idea, which is a precept that we receive. When it became our concept, it produced convictions in our belief system. That became our philosophy, what we think, and that is released out of my mouth and what we say. You understand? So holy nation, say it and look, say change of lingo, change the definition term. We're a holy nation. Now we're a royal priesthood. No, no, we are chosen generation. Yes, that's what we are. We citizens of heaven. We are ambassadors. Begin to say those words and then you'll cultivate your belief system to be kingdom fertile, a fertile ground for kingdom seed to be planted into. Matthew 12, 37. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Roman M, call Roman three and four. Certainly not. Indeed, let Elohim be true but every man a liar as it is written, not rewritten, not retranslated as it, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged or discerned or determined to be right or wrong. Very important that we understand the concept of a nation. Like I said, a lot of, points I could have went into we didn't go into it but this when you look at the concept of a nation and you start studying scripture like that it's going to change everything it'll eliminate that division it'll eliminate uh trust in, in the government and in uh man appointed religious leaders uh to establish the kingdom of heaven in the earth no president can establish a kingdom, the government of the kingdom of heaven in the earth no religious institution can do that because again they are separate and when the kingdom government come to the earth in its full force and power, all other governments will be crushed. So praying for something that's going to be totally destroyed and crushed by the father, asking the father to savage something that he have already predetermined is going to be destroyed doesn't make sense. And again, as we uh, close here, we're going to be talking about those verses where he said, pray for authorities, pray for kings, pray for those in government. We're going to talk about that from a national concept and look at those words. And we're going to find out, did the father say pray for evil? Or was he saying petition your government to make sure this government doesn't infiltrate your appointment and your mandate? Was he saying petition me because you in the midst of darkness for your uh, provisions, for your protection? We're going we're gonna to look at that because, again, changing of definition of terms, phraseologies, metaphors that's been put in translation, got people praying for evil right now and got people actually thinking that their prayers for evil are going to work. And they are not getting to heaven. They are not going to where, beloved, they are not doing anything. All right. Love you much. Appreciate you much. I heard, well, but Pastor, are you saying we shouldn't? I'm saying we should get some education. That's what we should do and understand who we are, understand our mandate. And if it doesn't have to do with our mandate, it's not our fight. That's what I'm saying. Thank you, ma'am, sir. All right. Thank you so much. Those who the Holy Spirit are dealing with right now. I know he's dealing with your heart now. You are the ones that's in a proper position to receive salvation, to be born again to have the Holy Spirit come back in you and govern your life through the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit to acknowledge Yeshua as being your Lord. And that take place as a result of your belief. You don't say stuff to believe it. You believe for those who believe right now that Yeshua, he is real. He did pay the price for you. I just told you uh, in the teaching, you got that. You're hearing that now. And you want to be a part of the holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a special people. The way to get into the citizen and become a citizen of heaven is acknowledging that Yeshua, the last Adam, is owner. He is Lord of everything and confess and renounce the lifestyle that you are living, the religion that you are involved in and come on into the kingdom. Once you do that, be sure to get with a pastor who understand by illumination of the Holy Spirit and are teaching kingdom concepts. And I know that won't be easy to find, but you're going to have to search it out. This pastor might not be on TV. They might not have 80,000 following, but they are there. They are everywhere, all across the land. They don't have the media platform. So don't go that route. Get on your knees. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, direct you. What congregation do I need to 
be a part of, where I, where I need to connect to. If you're out of state, we'll be glad to receive you. Through technology, we can pastor you, teach you, train you, fellowship with you. And we can uh, hold you in a temporary a pastoral recovery until you locate a local kingdom-centered ministry. Just because it got kingdom on it, don't mean that it has kingdom uh, concepts in it. Love you much, appreciate you much, and our congregation will be flowing over into uh, private congregational page. Love you much, appreciate you much. Shalom.